I've been warned to speak very slowly. <laughs> so I uh, try to respect that. Um, so, uh, so first, uh, uh, forgive me for uh, just uh, presenting a few uh, basic uh, slides on, on what, uh, what we do in, in program evaluation. I first uh, just want to say what do we mean by, by impact of so program evaluation. Uh, Estimate impacts of, uh, of social of social programs or any any type of program, and when we uh, estimate impacts, so I had promised. I think these are the only equations in the whole <laughs> the whole uh, presentation. What we mean very specifically uh, by impact that uh, what we would like to measure uh, for people who uh, participate in the program, we would like to measure impact comparing what happens to them when they participate in a program versus what would happen to them if they didn't uh, participate. So that's, uh, that's the kind of the mental exercise that we have in uh, program evaluation. So in the, you know, in the quick equation, what we want to estimate is for those people who do participate, we want to estimate uh, what their result would be uh, under a world of treatment versus their result without, without a treatment. So right away, we come to the, you know, the famous evaluation uh, problem that you know, we can't observe people who participate in the program. We can't observe what would have happened to them if they hadn't uh, participated, and we call that uh, the counterfactual. So, in terms of the equation, we don't uh, we don't observe y zero for those who. So. All right. So, in the in the picture, um, what we have um, so it's just uh, models. Um, what I just said, so if the yellow line are people who uh, participate in the program, and may we observe them, what they do before the program and after, but we don't know what would have happened to them uh, without the program. So that's modeled by the blue line, the counterfactual. And so, you know, it's very easy to estimate, to observe data for program participants uh, under the program, but what we don't observe is what would happen to them if they didn't participate. So that's what we have to estimate. That's really kind of the key in program evaluation. So, so how do we do that? Um, so we do that by selecting a group which is not affected by the program, and we use them uh, to measure, to estimate the counter counterfactual. So experimental evaluations, what they do is they use random assignment, uh, usually eligible beneficiaries that are randomly assigned uh, to to treatment. And control uh, versus uh, non-experimental evaluations, which uh, will argue that a particular group under certain conditions uh, can replicate the, the counterfactual. Okay, so the kind of one of the, the main uh, concern with uh, estimation is avoiding selection bias. And selection bias is just that people who participate in programs are are normally different from those who don't participate for many reasons. Uh, programs are often only located in certain geographical areas. Uh, many are means tested, so you have to qualify the low income or, or other conditions to satisfy uh, to participate. And also, participation is uh, voluntary. Um, so, uh, so the uh, when we um, yeah, if we don't pick right our control group, our comparison group, then uh, we can have uh, selection bias. And so what that means is that our comparison group in the absence of the program is not very comparable to the treatment. That's what we have to worry about uh, in uh, choosing our, our method of evaluation. Okay, so let me uh, now start moving towards uh, talking about um, experimental designs and, and data. And so experimental designs, uh, so where you randomly assign um, people to, to different groups to, to treatment uh, uh, and control. They have a long history in medical studies. Um, they've also been used uh, in developed countries, the U.S. and Europe, to evaluate Impacts of government programs like job training, and they've been used for uh, decades um, there. And you know, kind of experimental designs are um, really 
Now, now kind of, you know, it seems like they're having uh, the sort of on everyone's uh, minds and development and uh, what's happened during the last uh, 20 years or so is a, a very large growth in uh, using experimental designs or to pilot, pilot interventions uh, in, in the area of development in developing countries. So, uh, the settings are new, so not so much the, the methods. And so, so now there's all these um, pilot interventions using uh, experimental design to try and figure out what uh, what works with the idea to potentially scale up to larger programs that help uh, promote development in developing or poor countries. Um, so we have here the great uh, example in Mexico, Prospera, uh, which was previously called uh, Opportunidades, which was previously called uh, Progress. It's an early example in this. In this literature, and then we also have the you know the Poverty Action Lab, who's been promoting all these sort of small, small scale uh, interventions. One, a very famous one uh, that you might have heard about was in the news. It's an older study, but it's uh, been in the news a lot recently. But Kramer, uh, uh, Ted Miguel, and Michael Kramer, uh, their piece on uh, impacts of dewarming. In uh, Kenya, and, you know the typical one there. You know the Progressa, the Prospera evaluation is a much larger evaluation. In a sense, uh, you know, we call it a pilot, uh, but it's an early example of a program that was evaluated with an experimental design and scaled up. And so, but the typical small-scale pilots that uh, lots of people are doing that nowadays have small. Um, you know, they're small. So 75 schools. Uh, this this paper on worms, uh, which are allocated to two treatment groups. Local area. Okay, so why do we just state the obvious? Why do people like experimental design so much? And um, the, oops, sorry, the reason is, uh, you know, when they're done well, and I, you know, I'm going to skip a lot of the operational details. So if they're not done well, they have just as many problems as uh, not, not experimental designs. When they're done well with a you know, reasonable a sample size, uh, the idea is they, uh, they provide a very good uh, estimate of the kind of function. So a randomly assigned control group uh, it, uh, gives a good estimate of the counterfactual and so allows us to provide uh, unbiased estimates. Okay, so here's just a, so, uh, just a picture to <laughs> distract from all the work, but uh, just some of what random assignments. Uh, uh, would, would look like. Um, uh, so, so, so what happens when you, uh, you know, what's alternative to carry on experiments and there's uh, lots of non-experimental uh, methods for constructing uh, the counterfactual um, that I, I'm just going to list uh, here and I'm not going to uh, say, say too much uh, about them. Uh, these non-experimental methods which I try to construct the control group. Um, uh, that's a good uh, estimate of a counterfactual. I'm going to put particular emphasis in uh, you know, the rest of the talk on the last, the before and after difference in different methods. This is actually uh, useful for all types of estimators. So there's you know, difference in difference matching estimators, regression, instrumental variables, and also uh, they're used for experiments. So by difference in difference, I mean before and after for treatment. And, It's a non-random assignment where we need to you know, control for whatever is making uh, uh, the treatment uh, group look different than the control group uh, before the program begins. Okay, so what um, what happens in uh, these field experiments? And now I'm going to start talking about um, about data. So you know, for evaluations of uh, these small-scale uh, type pilots. Uh, how, does, how does that work? How does the data collection work? Uh, so the, usually the experiment doesn't last too long. Uh, so it's uh, maybe uh, a year or two and the program uh, may end. You know, the researcher ran out of money to uh, uh, keep the program going. Or sometimes, uh, you know, the government can step in. This happens uh, sort of the model of Prospera. Uh, the control group becomes a treatment group. So you also lose your experiment. Not because the program ended, but because the control group also became. So, 
Lots of these small uh, experiments are focused in a local geographic area, so it's saying a you know, small sample of schools, and they're not usually uh, nationally represented, but maybe in uh, one, or, one or two states. Uh, most of these uh, experimental evaluations focus on short-term impacts. So the idea is you would have baseline data. Um, so if your experiment's uh, well done, you might say, well, why do you need it? First, well, you certainly need the baseline data to check whether your uh, experiment is well done. Um, and of course, it also provides a baseline for what the population looks like before the, the program started. Uh, longitudinal data, uh, one or two uh, follow-up rounds, and these data tend to focus on impact indicators. Uh, of, uh, of. And what are the you know, advantages? I'll come to ask me and talk a little about advantages and disadvantages. And this has uh, been a resistant temptation to talk for a very long time about this, but uh, just mention, you know, the you know, why are they so popular and the uh, main potential advantage, assuming they're well done, is, uh, you know, what I uh, earlier said, giving a plausible estimate of the counterfactual. And I do have an important disadvantage that Angus Deaton, the recent Nobel Prize, uh, is uh, very vocal about voicing, and that their impacts are only valid for the, the population uh, study, and said, you know, a local example, do the, you know, the impacts of the Prospera program in you know, rural Oaxaca. Tell us anything about the uh, impacts uh, in Guadalajara, and you know, not, not clear they do. Um, so, in fact, Angus Deaton makes this uh, criticism, and this is you know, interesting when we, uh, in terms of talking about the data, that he says, well, that these populations are so specialized that uh, what you really want to know is what are the impacts on the overall population that's eligible. And so, you know, he brings up this, uh, this idea that you are better off using more nationally representative survey data that might be more subject to selection bias, but would have a larger, more representative sample that tells you more about program impacts than, than these small scale uh, studies in, in very local uh, areas. Okay, now that's, now that's a, a very, you know, that's a powerful, important idea. You know, whether you can kind of trade off a bit of selection bias, but on a more representative uh, sample. And, you know, the question would be, how can we judge that? Uh, how, can, how can we measure that? And that's a, that's a, pretty, uh, that's a pretty tough question. But um, here's uh, maybe uh, a way of, of looking at it. And uh, so, can, so here's a question. Um, can non-experimental evaluation replicate the results from experimental evaluations, can they, and what, you know, what data and methods um, exist for this. And so, you know, if we just assume for a moment that experimental methods will give us the, you know, the best approximation to the true impacts, so under what conditions, um, with what data methods, can non-experimental evaluations replicate experimental evaluations? Um, so you might say, well, how, you know, since you can never observe the counterfactual, how could you possibly really have much, much of an idea? And the way that, you know, the studies, the way that this has been looked at and that you can look at it is in settings where you have an experimental design, you can see if you can try and replicate those impacts, assuming experimental impacts are correct, uh, try and replicate the non-experimental, so replicate the experimental impacts using non-experimental non methods like uh, matching. So Petra is a um, <coughs> great expert in, <laughs> in uh, this area. She has a very, uh, a very famous paper uh, on exactly this uh, topic and matching estimators uh, over, overall. Uh, and I'm going to summarize some of the, the results because they speak exactly to this question and what sort of data that you need for carrying out uh, non-experimental non evaluation. So this is a very uh, well-known well-cited paper matching as an econometric uh, estimator. And exactly what uh, one of the things that they do in this paper is look at uh, what variables do you need uh, to get a good estimate, a counterfactualized measure for uh, uh, so the experimental estimates. And what they find is, uh, you know, that so there's different ma matching uh, methods. 
that you can use. But uh, one of the you know important points of uh, their paper, especially for this uh, this audience, is that the available data really affects you know how well you can do replicating experimental uh, design. So if you don't have very detailed data, you can just have a few control variables to try and control for differences between treatment control group, and your biases will be uh, a lot higher. So this implies you really need a, a set of detailed control variables, so not just age and gender. Uh, uh, the usual set of control variables that can help you control for observable differences between treatment and control. And the other, uh, uh, some of the other implications their work is that if you need control and uh, treatment groups in the same geographical area and the same type, uh, same questionnaire, uh, same survey instrument apply to both the treatment and comparison groups. So this starts to give us some indications of what we need uh, for carrying out uh, non-experimental evaluations. Uh, in another paper, and this is also very, very key, and another, I, mean, I know it kind of all the Everyone's different topic. We're all saying, well, we need longitudinal data. And so I'm, uh, I'm going to continue that and say, but we need longitudinal data, um, not only for experiments, but for non experimental uh, design. And Petra has another paper that shows that difference in difference non experimental methods uh, based on matching. Again, they do a lot better than cross sectional models in cases, um, in, you know, overall generally, and also in cases where you don't have very good. Information, the difference in difference uh, methods can really get you a lot. If you really need by difference in difference, we need before and after information on uh, treatments and comparison. So, so uh, first conclusion, baseline data and hence longitudinal data following up of the program population is uh, really critical. And as an aside, I'll just say it's, you know, getting, uh, it's pretty challenging, both theoretically and uh, you know, just that a level of convincing uh, other people that your estimates are right. It's pretty hard to uh, generate credible impacts with non-experimental evaluations when you only have after program data. You really need uh, this longitudinal dimension to be able to measure uh, program impact. You need it for experimental evaluation as well because you need to be able to justify or show that your experiment is is um, okay. So uh, conclusion: we need uh, longitudinal. Okay. So what can go wrong uh, with experiments and uh, data collection? A pretty big, a lot of things that can go wrong, uh, but a pretty big one is uh, selective attrition. And so, you know, attrition is always a problem in longitudinal data. We've been hearing a lot about that in the, in the seminar. Uh, but, you know, it's maybe even worse with a program evaluation because you don't just have a problem of overall attrition. But you have the problem of selective. So often uh, programs affect probability that uh, you stay in the sample, that you can be uh, found uh, later on and interviewed. So it's very common. It's uh, really a big disaster <laughs> in, um, uh, in uh, experiments. And it really applies when you have selective attrition that the program predicts uh, who is interviewed, and you're really back, uh, back in the on experimental world of impact evaluation. And let me just say, you know, even attrition, which is not selective, is a big problem in uh, program evaluation uh, because uh, impacts will only reflect. Uh, so when you, when you have a program, you want to estimate the impacts on the entire uh, beneficiary population. But if you only manage to interview half of them, uh, then your impacts will only reflect uh, those that you interviewed. And, you know, usually it's not random uh, who leaves a sample, and it can be, you know, your impacts can end up being on those that are least affected by the program or at least the least interesting uh, population. I'll give a, an example uh, from the evaluation of uh, youth uh, beneficiaries in the, the conditional cash uh, transfer uh, prospera in rural areas. So this is, you know, this is a very, a very uh, famous, well-known evaluation, as I was mentioning earlier. So there was a randomly assigned treatment and and control group at the beginning of the you know, Prospera program back in 1997. And so, you know, it's a very famous evaluation. And in fact, Petra and I just wrote a, a, an article that's coming out in the Journal of Economic Literature summarizing all the short-term studies. You know, there are over 100 
looking at different effects of the program and education, health, you know, expenditures, women's status, name it. There's a million studies published in excellent you know, economics and health journals. So, but one of the you know the key questions of uh, the Prospera program is not just the short term impacts, uh, which are important, but what happens in the long term. So, because this program has you know, the objective of trying to break the you know, intergenerational cycle of poverty. And so the idea is, you know, kids get more education when they're young because of the you know, cash transfer they have to go to school for their parents to get the money. So later on, do they get better jobs uh, because of having more education? Now, that's a very interesting question. Uh, one of the you know, initial motivations of a, a program like this that paid kids basically to, to go to school. And so, you know, the experimental evaluation uh, that was very successful in the first uh, few years uh, later on had very high sample attrition. It was very hard to use uh, evaluation uh, to uh, provide, to answer this question, what happens to the youth who got more education because of the program? Why is it difficult? Because when uh, you know, the program went back to interview them, they didn't do a very good job of uh, following up. It's a very mobile population, kids uh, who are now you know, in their early 20s, they don't live with their parents anymore. And so, you know, this data that was captured after 10 years focused uh, only really had youth who were still living in rural areas with their parents in their house. That's a very selective population. That's not a population that you think would have the most impacts of the program. Right? Probably the population that benefits the most are those who migrate uh, to urban areas. Uh, anyway, that's uh, just an anecdote, but uh, and, you know, breaks up again, you know, the importance of all longitudinal data following up. So, and, but you know, with the perspective of program impacts, you know, if you don't follow them up, then you have a very biased, you have a partial view of program impacts because if you only know the impacts for those who uh, you can do. Okay, let me um, I'm talk about, uh, I'm going to focus on longer term program impacts and talk about uh, uh, data requirements, although these are also apply this to short-term uh, program impacts. You know, this idea of what uh, what are the longer-term impacts of, of programs, you know, I would argue that's you know, equal importance in the short-term or initial impact evaluation. You need both. You need to know whether the program is working uh, initially or and whether uh, these impacts that you might observe in the short-term uh, hold up over time. So there are two uh, at least two questions associated with longer term evaluation. So do initial program impacts hold up over time? So for instance, in the case again of uh, Prospera, there was an increase in the growth of very small children relative to controlled children before age two. So that happened after a year after the program. But so do we know that that's a permanent effect? So that treatment kids are gonna be taller always um, as a result of having participated in uh, Prospera, or will the control kids catch them? Okay, because then they start receiving uh, benefits as well. That's an example of why we need to look at longer term impacts. And also, maybe you're, you know, in the short term, your interest is okay, do more kids go to school? Uh, but in the long term, what you might be interested in is uh, what, whether that leads to higher, uh, higher wages. And so you need a long term impact uh, for that uh, to look at. Uh, impacts on other variables. Yeah, you know, even at an international level, it's surprising how few study the long term. Uh, those are the, the progressive kids <laughs> protesting. That's <laughs> true. That they're not going to But so. Uh, so there are really very few studies. It's amazing. Um, lots and lots of pilots of short-term impacts, but we have uh, very few studies of long-term impacts, almost uh, none in, in Mexico, the ones that are related uh, precisely to Prospera. You know, it is a growing uh, literature, and so now what I'd uh, like to talk about is what data <laughs> we need to uh, carry out uh, long-term evaluations. And here I'm going to give uh, for each type of uh, data I'm going to give an example of uh, one or two empirical uh, studies. 
Okay, so why are the alternatives for doing longer term impact evaluations? And so for experimental evaluations, well, you know, you can uh, do a follow up of original evaluation samples. Uh, you're, you, know, you have the issues, as I was mentioning, nutrition, you can have the issues for, for older populations of, uh, of mortality. Uh, here are a couple. A couple examples of studies uh, where the programs were evaluated in the short term and longer uh, term impacts were estimated. A paper with uh, with Petra and, and Jerry looking at uh, longer term impacts on, on education, trying to get at this issue of uh, you know, whether kids uh, not whether they have higher income or whether they get start to get better jobs uh, because of the higher education of opportunity. We have this uh, a follow up of the Worms uh, paper. Followed up with kids who had received these uh, anti-parasite medication, whether they had long-term impacts on uh, health investment. And you know, I'm going to mention uh, a bit more detail. Uh, long-term evaluation is a very famous one that's getting all sorts of uh, uh, sites in the, the media by uh, Heckman and uh, my colleagues from from Chicago uh, on the Perry uh, Preschool uh, program. This is the <laughs> Now I was thinking when that you know all these examples I've chosen are you know these amazing examples of 40 years of data and maybe you know maybe in Mexico we want to start a little bit lower our expectations that we're not tomorrow going to have 40 years of lots of data but uh, just to get an idea of what you know what what can be done um, so the Perry preschool program um, targeted uh, you know it's very uh, complete set of services provided to uh, to children in preschool, uh, targeted you know, very specific population, African American children with low uh, low IQs, you know, really one of the most disadvantaged uh, population. Um, you know, that's amazing. It's very small. Uh, so 123 participants. Um, they were randomly assigned in the 1960s. Uh, you know, they've been continuously followed up uh, since then. Attrition is low. It's only 11 and left the sample by age 40. And you know it's amazing. There are huge impacts on reduction so, and um, probability of being arrested, and being on welfare, and increases in earnings. And it's amazing. You know, I went. You know, it's a very interesting uh, program to study. And, and one, you know, one asked me, you know, this is, you know, I hesitate a little bit about putting it in the example because the sample size is very small. So, you know, I don't want to give kind of the impression that this sample size is always enough uh, for doing a long-term evaluation. You know, it's Enough in this case because the impacts were so large. You know, sample size and doing uh, you know power calculations is always a you know key component of, uh, of uh, program evaluation. Um, anyway, but that's an example of a long-term impact uh, using an experimental design of um, treatment and control group participants who were were called. Uh, what other alternatives? You know, not, uh, not every program has an experimental design. So here's a, an important question for uh, designing uh, longitudinal studies. So can longitudinal national representative data can it be used to evaluate uh, government programs? That uh, seems, you know, in a sense less costly than doing a special survey every time you have a program that you want to. To evaluate, so can you use uh, these large multi-purpose uh, uh, great data sets? Uh, for instance, um, you know we have these large programs in Mexico, so we're popular prospera. And do we have nationally representative data that can be used to evaluate? But you know maybe the data wasn't designed with the idea or the only idea of uh, uh, evaluating these programs. But uh, can they be used to do uh, non-experimental? Evaluations and in general for large programs like the World Popular most very yes. Uh, so and this is uh, mainly because they both have a sufficient observations of beneficiaries uh, in large part because the programs are big. And so that there are uh, a lot of observations uh, in the data and you have a uh, you know, longitudinal uh, aspect. You know the part of the, the opposite of that for small programs. <laughs> You know, you probably won't have, uh, you know, enough uh, program uh, participants. And even for large programs, you know, it might be hard to do, you know, this happens, for instance, in you know, trying to evaluate longer-term impacts of prosperity using the 
and XFLS, and you know, when I focus on rural areas and then by gender and age, you know, I start to not have enough uh, enough observations. So, uh, so that you know, that can be a limitation. But one, you know, one um, possible, you know, one recommendation for you know design of uh, alternative longitudinal survey, or you know, if there's opportunities to increase uh, the sample in existing longitudinal surveys like the NHS and the FFLS, is to oversample this advantage for poor populations. You know, it's very hard to predict what programs are going to come up in the future that you want to use the, the data for for evaluation. You no, know, but you have an oversample of a disadvantaged or poor population that increases the likelihood that this, you know, this, uh, you know, more representative data can be used uh, to evaluate uh, uh, future uh, future programs. Okay, so you know, I'll just mention uh, uh, the evaluation, this uh, you know, non-experimental evaluation that uh, we did with um, Rebecca Wong and Joe Sine, the evaluation of the Seguro uh, Popular program in Mexico, you know, just the Seguro Popular, what, what is it? You know, it's a health insurance program targeted toward workers in uh, uh, informal sectors. So Mexico uh, traditionally has had very low coverage of Social Security just because it's restricted only to workers in the formal sector, which is consistently uh, been less than 50%. And so this health insurance program, uh, uh, Seguro Popular, was int introduced for uh, the informal sector and this started in 2002 so you know we have the amazingly convenient baseline of impact that was carried out in 2001 provides a perfect uh, baseline you know for uh, measuring how people were before uh, the program started and we have you know lots of coverage in that house because it's a gigantic program so by 2015 you know a program that you know that just started more than about 10 years ago has more than 50 million uh, people. So let's say about 40 percent. I, I said, so that's about 40 percent of the Mexican population. So that's uh, that's huge. And so yeah, so that's a great feature for program evaluation that you know, the baseline turned out um, to be a baseline for the uh, Seguro Popular. We have 2,657 beneficiaries in the 2000 and I'm sorry, it's 2012 uh, follow-up rounds of uh, NPAS, and then we also combine it with administrative data on available health services, uh, like some heterogeneity impacts on whether impacts are greater or smaller for when you have easier access to health services, and we use difference in different uh, estimation. Uh, so this was an you know, example where you know, it was very easy to take uh, existing longitudinal data and use it to evaluate an important uh, large uh, uh, program. Mexico, you know, we were a bit lucky in terms of the baseline uh, the first round of the NHS was exactly a baseline for uh, for the evaluation. Uh, here, this is just uh, this is just showing you know kind of why it was such a uh, such a good source. Uh, so this shows uh, you know again with longitudinal data. So since here we just we divide people into four groups: so those who didn't have health insurance in either round. Uh, those who had health insurance before, but not after, vice versa. So here, what you know, what you can see is, especially if you look at rural areas, so we have almost half of the population, 46.4%, who didn't have insurance uh, pre-program, so in 2001 before the Seguro Popular, and now do. Okay, so this is really, you know, it's a big intervention, and lots of people uh, participate. So this is ideal. There are a lot of uh, features that made this ideal. Uh, data source uh, to use and having different to different before and after and a large uh, population. Okay. okay, here's another example of a, a long term evaluation uh, of Head Start. This is one of an early example of a long term evaluation uh, from the US, a uh, study of long term impacts of Head Start, which early childhood program for, for, uh, for kids and using the NLSY, a very uh, well known. Uh, uh, longitudinal survey in the U.S. and it does have an oversample of the poor uh, population. And you know their their strategy uh, was comparing siblings uh, with uh, who participate and the siblings who don't participate because they're too too old uh, when uh, the program started. And so why you know this is uh, they're really able to 
uh, carry out an impact, a long term impact estimation of the effects of Head Start uh, using the NLSY because of this over uh, sampling of the poor population. That's really was uh, key to being able to have enough samples, enough beneficiaries of your program to estimate. Okay, um, what's another alternative? Uh, what else can you do? And this is, you know, really, uh, you know, I think, a uh, big growing area. We really, in Mexico, it'd be great to start uh, uh, doing more of uh, this, linking administrative data to evaluation sample data. Again, I'm going to put an example that's uh, an unbelievable example, but uh, this uh, work by Raj Chetty and co-authors on how your kindergarten classroom affects your earnings. You know, so in later life, or you feel bad that my kids in kindergarten didn't learn anything. <laughs> I'm terrible teachers. So, <laughs> their life is over their life. <laughs> or at least they, they didn't get this advantage that they could have gotten to get higher earnings because of having a good kindergarten teacher. Hey. Okay, so what did they do in this study? So this was a, a program called STAR, and what it did was it randomly assigned kindergarten, kindergarten kids to small or larger uh, classrooms, and so, you know, it was amazing, so the kids who were assigned uh, to a higher quality classroom, so with smaller classroom size and better teachers, they find all these impacts later on are more likely to attend college and pay for retirement and live in better neighborhoods and all these effects of not having a a good teacher at small class in kindergarten, you might say, God, you know, how could you do a study like this? It would be incredibly expensive because you have to locate all up all these kindergartners, you know, that you don't, you know, in the beginning, all you have is school records, you know, what school they were in. And, uh, and so the way that uh, they did the study was they linked the kindergarten school records to tax records. So it's not that they followed up the kids. 30 years later to see where they were. They just used administrative records, basically tax records, how did they link using a social security number, data for gender and the name. So you have this amazing you know, data where you have kinder, kindergarten school records and teacher that the child had in kindergarten linked to their earnings uh, uh, later on. So, uh, so this, is, uh, uh, this is pretty uh, amazing. So, but we do, you know, I think there is starting to be more more of these uh, that use the administrative data. So here's an example of using administrative data for evaluation of the more popular in Mexico. And so, you know, like I said, the say more popular is only for the workers in the informal sector. And so uh, this is created a, a small literature on asking whether this is actually create incentives for workers to choose informal sector jobs over uh, formal sector jobs. So, uh, so there's a study of this. Um, um, uh, was here uh, was here yesterday, and so he's one of the authors on, on this paper. I'm sorry that it's just awful yellow, and I missed, you know, I couldn't get that yellow font to go away, you know, the line, but uh, anyway, but so this is a paper that looks at, you know, does, um, let's say, more popular, uh, make workers more likely to work in the informal sector as opposed to the formal sector, and how do they uh, study this question, and this is another great example of using uh, nationally, you know, this is so there. You know, this is an evaluation that focuses on one state. You know, this is a national evaluation. They'll be using uh, Social Security data. So the EANS has a lot of administrative data to on the Social Security population, their wages, longitudinal uh, data on wages, conditions, firms, uh, tenure, and so you know they merge that data with administrative data on the number of they work with our beneficiaries uh, to study. Uh, study this so this is a great uh, example of uh, using uh, administrative data to carry out program impacts. Uh, okay, so I'm going to uh, conclude just with some uh, well, a few tentative conclusions and possible suggestions uh, uh, for for data uh, summary. So you know, no way around it. Longitudinal data before and after is a must for getting. Uh, Credible program impacts both for experimental and experimental uh, methods. Uh, with respect to 
household level surveys. You know, I want to push a little this this uh, idea of you know oversampling uh, for populations either within uh, existing longitudinal surveys or you know for the future uh, forthcoming uh, longitudinal surveys. That's going to help increase the probability of having sufficient beneficiaries of disadvantaged populations of existing programs and you know, new programs that uh, you know, come up. Or you know why not? Um, wish list. <laughs> no, why not a longitudinal panel in Mexico focusing only on on the poor uh, population? Uh, you know, I think that really, uh, you know, I mean, there's, you know, I know all the, you know, I've lived here a long time, I know all the, uh, the defects, you know, the curve, nobody can remember, so the curve is a kind of approximate uh, to a social security number in Mexico. Everybody's supposed to have a curve. Nobody remembers their curve. It's, <laughs> it's, a real, it's a real problem, but here, you know, we're starting to have a, a national uh, number. So, I mean, I think it's really, you know, we can start taking further steps of linking administrative data, tax returns, or other administrative data. You know, EADS has years and years of health uh, clinics, of results, and health outcomes that could be potentially linked uh, to individuals. So, I think, you know, we really need to really start. Uh, you know, expanding in this area, linking administrative data to to household data. I'll just mention the curve can be looked up on the internet. You know, I don't know if this is a violation of privacy, but you know, anybody can look up somebody's uh, somebody's curve just with their name, where they were born, and their and their place of birth. And finally, you know, the issue of sample size. Uh, you know, I haven't focused on that really in this talk, but that you know, you got to do your power calculations and. Well, it's worth investing in a lot of student data. But, uh, Extra observations, uh, you know, you need a usually fairly large sample size unless you're pretty sure your program will have a large, uh, large effect. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, I wanted to bring up one of, from one of your conclusions. Yesterday, I mentioned that in the move towards trying to um, create a longitudinal studies culture in Mexico, we would like to have in place some kind of ID that we can follow, and also an ID that we can link the administrative records with. So that uh, would help us follow people, but also in the lineage, and then. Also, I think we have to think of a culture in which the administrative records are shared, available, open to the researchers, because it's not the case right now. So you mentioned IMSS has years and years of Social Security records, but very few people have access to those. Right? And so it's the same case for, um, you know, COSAR, the retirement records, that, that they have to come up with some culture in which they say these records have to be used with all the protective measures for confidentiality and so on. But there's got to be something in place. Again, start the movement towards in that direction. It was just a comment. And not a but yeah, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, one area that I don't know whether kind of academic community Hello? So, yeah, one mechanism, which I don't know how much the academic community has used, and I, have, you know, I haven't used it uh, myself, embarrassingly, but, uh, you know, there are these new transparency laws in Mexico where you're supposed to be able to get access to, to confidential data. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't know uh, almost any any data really. So I don't know if that's a, an area that, that exploited exploited more. So yeah, but I agree that it's a real a real problem um, that often you know you get the data because you maybe you knew somebody and it's you know not publicly available. And you know, I remember you know 
and Kennedy was here giving, you know, presenting his book uh, about a year ago. You know, and he was trying to get access. You know, he wanted to, you know, kind of do the same uh, replication for Mexico that he'd done for European countries on, you know, estimating inequality and concentration of wealth, and you know, he wasn't able to get access to uh, you know, tax records from the same institution. Uh, that's a real, uh, real shame. Types of data that are available. Uh, I have to say that also, I mean, in, in the same vein, uh, education records and property of uh, general directors in some place, in the, you know, secretary of education. So I, I think it, we need to move forward on that. Okay, another uh, question? Yes. I was wondering, Susan, if the, the key number from PROGRESA can be used and half, or half of the poor population is on PROGRESA. So how can, how these numbers have been used in the past or how do you think they may be used? Yeah, I mean, you're right, they do have a mystery number. Yeah, I didn't put them on my slide. Um, so, you know, originally, yeah, I think the idea that so Sol Progenesis conditional cash transfer program has about uh, 50 million um, people, about um, many households. Is that uh, about seven, yeah, seven or eight million? Um, and so, actually, the idea was uh, that that would form kind of a, a registry for the foreign population because it seemed that you didn't need to interview that many more in order to have a pretty complete uh, registry of the foreign population. So that they could use also for other other programs. So in fact, you know, Oprah Prospera beneficiaries are eligible for other programs automatically. Um, so so they definitely use the ID number for that. But uh, you know, again, I, I don't know how much that number can relate to to other data like tax records. <coughs> There is time for another one. Yes, listen. Uh, thank you. Um, I just have a question on the, um, on the, the uh, um, experiment with the information from the data you showed about the ANHAS. Um, um, the ANHAS study with the ex showing the expansion of the, kind of this, the, this, um, the insurance um, over time. I wondered whether you had looked at the kind of any of the outcome data, uh, outcome variables in the survey in terms of whether this has kind of improved people's health, having the access to health insurance. Oh, music to my ears, that question. <laughs> so, how much longer do I have to talk about that? Talk about our paper. So, um, again, yeah, no, I'll just briefly answer. So, our paper, in fact, studies um, health impacts because. There are other studies of the Segur Popular, and what they show is that their impacts on reducing catastrophic expenditures and increasing utilization, and that's kind of what you expect from health insurance. And so we try to go a step further at looking at uh, other health uh, behaviors. So we look at preventive, so whether you, uh, you're more likely to have a test uh, for diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, you know, prostate. Uh, we also look at treatment. So if you are have it diagnosed, now you know Mexico has a big problem with many other countries that lots of people are undiagnosed. You know, they are diabetic but they don't know or they are hypertensive, they don't know. But for the population that um, that does know, so some of our results show that the Segur popular increases the probability of being in treatment. For a country with such a high level of diabetes and hypertension that those are encouraging. <laughs> Yes, Victor. Uh, I wonder if uh, you have looked at differences uh, between regions, uh, say between the urban area and the rural area, and also the uh, geographical regions and at the state level in coverage and she said in health outcomes and utilization. 
regarding the rule of law. The six study. Um, yeah, yeah. So we looked at impacts by separately for rural and urban areas. Um, so the impacts tend to be larger in rural areas. That's uh, what you expect because that's where the increases in the cover of population with insurance are, are greater. Um, although we do find something interesting in rural areas where um, impacts are, so they're higher in rural areas, but then when we disaggregate rural areas into in some rural areas in Mexico, very almost no health services available. So when we disaggregate into areas with kind of good health services versus uh, not very many health services measured by a uh, number of doctors, uh, we find that the impacts are greater for in areas where they have better access to services. So that the impacts really work for a population that didn't have health insurance and furthermore not that far away from health services. That's where it seems that there's larger impact. And I'll just say, and this, well, this is more of a program evaluation issue, you know, one challenge for the say war global diary, it's not, it, it's introduced in a context where there are other alternatives to health insurance. You know, it's not, you know, you know, with or without health insurance, you know, there are other possible health insurance if there's social security. And so, um, so focus on rural uh, beneficiaries is, you know, kind of helpful because a population that has fewer opportunities for all alternative health insurance. It's easier to isolate the impact versus not having access. Yeah, so this is not like a question, it's more like a comment, no? So Susan mentioned the huge literature that there is about Prospera, Progresa, Oportunidades. There's also a huge literature now about the Seguro Popular, and most of it is because there is the data to do that, no? And there are tens of programs here in Mexico, no, in, in the Coneval has a list of all the programs, and, and we don't know much about most of them because we don't have the data. No? If so, if there were longitudinal, longitudinal studies, we could be doing much more research about all those programs. So, that's just my. Thank you very much, Carlos. Yeah. 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 We're, we're like the drunk man, I'm looking for his skills just under the light because that's where he can be. No? So much we can do. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is, so I suppose you would say the language of economies, there is kind of a delineate effect of what? how much work has been done, how much data we got. Other question, please. Is that it? <laughs> okay, it's so. done. Maybe just a comment. Mm -hmm. You just said, for example, in the Columbus survey, we had reports of social programs from the people that are surveyed, and they don't really know which are the programs that they receive, the names of the programs. So in fact, uh, regarding the need for longitudinal surveys, I think it's very important to have IDs and to be able to connect with administrative data, and that way also to uh, evaluation. So I think we, like, we need, here in Mexico and in other countries, like the linkage of these two things right. in order to do the evaluation. Yeah, that, that's also kind of very Nice comment because, I, I, and I think in the talk of Susan, she was talking about, you know, the linkage uh, kind of agenda. I, I think that's very important, uh, but uh, we don't really need to get access to those administrative records. Another question. Uh, okay, so we're gonna have a long break. Uh, Thanks to Susan, please.